I've adjusted my life. If I've got to read that thing four times a year to get it familiar enough to me so at least I can say, wait a minute, I remember that story. Hang on a second. And if I, I think the cell phone's cool for that. That's about it. But you can sit there and do a search on the, of this and pull that verse up just like that. I, I'm like, Lord, I said, I wish I could just pull them things right up like that. I've seen people do that. But I can't. Excuse me, Beth says she fixed that. I will have to talk to her about that. We'll fix that after church. Uh, but anyways, uh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh says he, he uh, brings him up and he says, and I understand a dream. Uh, he said, I've heard of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. Uh, if somebody come up and asks you a question, that's where Joseph is sitting here. He's depending on the Lord to do that. Pharaoh tells the reason he was brought before him. Uh, Pharaoh starts, uh, that, uh, starts that he needs to know what the dream means, and no one in his realm can say it. He already knows that the gods that Pharaoh has, the gods that Egypt has, can't solve his problem. The dream was obviously intense enough to Pharaoh that he knew that that thing meant something. Uh, it wasn't just a nightmare that you have and you wake up in the middle of the night and say, well, you know, I had this nightmare and forget about it. This thing lingered in Pharaoh's mind. He couldn't get it out. Pharaoh states that he heard Joseph's ability. A butler come up and, and told him his ability. He said, hey, I got this guy. Because his butler was there, now he trusts his life to his butler. His butler obviously takes the grapes, squeezes them in the cup, drinks some of it, or however he does, pours it in another cup. Uh, I guess they don't get the backwash or whatever. I'm not sure if the butlers actually drank the thing and then handed him the cup that he drank out of. But, but he hands him, the, the, he trusts the butler with his life. And the butler says, I, I remember my faults this day. I know a guy. And because of that little piece of testimony there, Joseph was brought up from the bottom of the prisons to talk to Pharaoh to see if he could help him. Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh uh, an answer of, the, of peace. Joseph has just told Pharaoh uh, some stuff right off the bat before Pharaoh even tells him what the dream is. Joseph never blinks an eye. He doesn't hesitate. He tells exactly what Pharaoh, he, why? Joseph already has a relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. He already has a relationship with God. So when it comes time to stand before, you know what our, most of our problem is, is we want to stand before Pharaoh. Everybody wants to be elevated, but we don't know how to stand there when we get there. And when we get there, we won't know how to answer what needs to be said because we're going to be afraid of the position that's in front of us. Brethren, you got to learn. That stuff is all learned. It's learned as you go through life. And people think, well, I can just do, I can do what you do, Mike. No, you can't. You may if you've had the training. I'll give you that. But if you haven't done this for a while, or if you haven't done this for some amount of time, try, you ought to try it sometime. I remember the first time I preached in Bible school. They gave us a five-minute message to preach. I thought it was like three days. I was like, five minutes? I can't do five minutes. Yeah, I hear y'all say that. I hear somebody say, hey, you want to preach? Oh, I can't preach, man. Five minutes? Five minutes. I can't preach five minutes? Five minutes? It's like an eternity. I was there just like you were. You know what Dr. Rutman did? He made us get up and preach. And then, he, then uh, as time went on, he lengthened that thing out. I remember the time he said, hey, Mike, I want you to preach uh, at church on this day. I'm like, oh, I was stunned, man. He let me actually preach a whole service. I couldn't believe it. I mean, like, twice he let me do that. I couldn't believe it. I said, and I still can't believe it to this day. After each one of those, he should have took my, my he should have just kicked me out of school. He should have never let me stay. But it's something you got to learn. Joseph never blinks an eye. He was already prepared. God had prepared him for that day and that hour and that minute. Everything Joseph went, you know what's all about attitude? It's your attitude. Your attitude either stinks or it's good. There's like, I like, I like tribulation when you get over there. Uh, he talks about the Laodicean church. He said, I would that you were cold or hot, but you're lukewarm. He said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You're not supposed to be in the middle. You're either supposed to be cold as anything. Now watch, everybody won't show up for church later on. They'll just leave. Or you're supposed to be hot. Or moving to the temperature, the gauge should be moving to one side or the other, not dead center. And you got to learn that thing. It's a learned thing. You say, well, I don't want to do it. Well, I don't want to do it either. I'm out of my realm right now. In doing this job right here, I'm out of my realm. You want me to fix something? I'll fix it all day long. Put me here, I'm out of my realm. I have to force myself do, to do what I'm doing right now. Some of you wouldn't have to do that. Some of you have the capability of handling this, this position or doing this job, and, and you got the gift of gab, and you will do it, and you don't have one thing. You, I mean, your mind's just as sharp as a tack, and you won't do it. I don't understand why. 
If, you're, if you know that you're serving the God of this universe, why wouldn't you do it? Joseph knew exactly who he was serving. He knew exactly who he answered to. Pharaoh asked him, and I, Joseph was not afraid in a prison to tell the jailer that, hey, this needs to be done, to tell Potiphar, hey, this needs to be done. That's why everybody entrusted him with what he was getting as he came along because he was, he was faithful in what he was doing, but he was sure of himself. Have you ever been sure of yourself? I think Balovich, Commander Balovich was great. I love that man. I tell everybody all the time. I might have to look him up one of these days uh, if he's still alive. That man actually gave me the ability to be sure of myself. He wanted me to be confident in myself of what, what I was doing. And he started giving me little tasks to do to see if I would take it and move with it. Just like, And he kept doing it. And he kept doing it. The whole two years I was there, he kept doing it. He never stopped. And he, I mean, he kept dumping and dumping and dumping. He was looking for a place where I broke and I wouldn't break. So he'd put more on. The guy just, that's what he did. You know what he was doing? He was training me. That's all that guy was doing. I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know that for years. He was training me to be able to take, uh, take charge of something in a crisis, deal with something, and come out on the other side still floating. You ever thought about being on a ship in the middle of the ocean and a torpedo hits the side of your ship and you get a hole about the size of the back wall there and water's rushing in and you're going to play Titanic? No, our job was to keep that thing floating. You can't freak at that point and just crumble. Crumble after you get the thing floating. Keep it floating. Get the water out of there, then crumble. But don't crumble right then there. That's a train. That's, that's a learned event. You know what Joseph had learned all the way down? He had learned how to know whatever state he was in, he was content. He didn't necessarily like to be there. Content don't mean, I'm so happy I'm here in prison. That's not what that means. Hey, I'm here today. If I'm here today, let me figure out what I'm doing today, and I'll do the best I can today. You know, God's watching everything that man's doing. He's watching everything we're doing. He's seeing how well you react to what he puts in your life. And he expects you to say, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Have you ever read that verse over in Isaiah? It's the greatest verse, one of the greatest verses in your Bible. Come now, saith the Lord. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. He wants to talk to you and me. He wants to have a conversation. He wants to say, do this, don't do that. You shouldn't be doing this. Have you ever thought about this? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins, let's talk about your sin. Have you ever thought that this is a sin? Have you ever thought, have you ever wondered... Let me ask you a question. Do you still have a conscience? <laughs> that verse will just run through your mind and you'll sit there and go, ah, I got a conscience, Lord, and that thing's bugging me. And I need to stop that. Yes, you do. That, uh, okay, let's talk. He's not going to come down and hit you with a brick. He's going to talk to you. You know what he wants to do? He wants to talk to you your whole life. That's where Joseph is. Joseph is sitting here. Joseph's answer is to God, not to man. He doesn't care about Pharaoh. He doesn't care. He's going to give him the answer that he wants. He's not going to be bitter. You know, Joseph could have been bitter about being in prison. I ain't going to tell you nothing, man. I hope you all starve to death. I've seen Christians like that, where they're just bitter and angry because they didn't get what they thought they should get. Exactly what do you think we should get anyways? We deserve hell, and we got out of that. What, what should I get? What should I get that I should be so bitter that I didn't get? I don't even know what I, if the Lord knows the end from the beginning, he already knows what my outcome's going to be. I'm not Calvinist by any means. I just think that he already knows the decisions I'm going to make because of the things he places in my life. If he knows the end from the beginning, he already knows that. I'm saying, okay. Maybe I should just be happy right here where I'm at and let the Lord decide. That's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Let him decide to open the doors in front of you, and then you choose to walk through that door or not. Instead of trying to plow those doors down. Joseph was just that way. He said, he never blinks an eye, but he tells Pharaoh, it is not him, but God that gives the interpretation. You know, when you get to a place like that and you're afraid to say something about the Lord, it doesn't matter what the situation you're in. I don't really care, man. <laughs> That, that thing in the Chiefs, man, I, I want to get to heaven. I want to get a rerun on that. I, wanna, I want the Lord to show you. I was scared to death, man. I was scared to death. I can still see myself with my head over a plate of green spaghetti. I'm scared to death. And here's 70, 60, 70 Chiefs in there, E7, and Marines, everybody, E7 and above. And I'm sitting there bowing my head. I'm saying, Lord, I done messed up. I done messed right up. <laughs> said, it wasn't the green spaghetti. I don't care about the green spaghetti. I eat that. It's just food coloring. I said, and, and they had bread. All that stuff was good. I'm sitting there going, Lord, I done messed up. I done messed up. And it's like Holy Spirit saying, yep, you done messed up. I told you not to take that test, didn't I? But yeah, you told me not to take that test. And I, did, I took that test. It seemed like days. It was only a couple seconds. And next thing I know, I'm on my feet, and me and the old master chief is going at it. 
And I'm telling him he offends my God. Now, that guts came from the Holy Spirit. That was not me. I mean, it was me, but the, the boldness came from him. It never came, it came from me. I was, a few minutes later, I, I, earlier, I was sitting there just saying, I, I done blew it, man. I done choked. I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. They kicked me out of the chief's mess. I'm floating down the hallway. I go right to Mass Chief one year's office because that's what the Lord told me to do. And I'm in there talking to him, telling him what I just did in his chief's mess. I didn't really care at that point. I don't care. Take me to the captain. Kill haul me. Do whatever you want. I don't care. I'm going to tell you what God said. Uh, it was already done anyway, sir. <laughs> it didn't matter. And, uh, you know, you see, you do stuff like that. And you say, Lord, I could never be like Joseph. He goes, well, you're back there. You did a pretty good job. You did exactly what you were supposed to do. And, and all through life, you have learned all the way through here to stand. Now, I would have never done that four or five years earlier. Uh, it, it took time. And I didn't do that just to be mean. I did that because I was between a rock and a hard place. And they were going to make me do something I should not do. And I either was going to sin against God or make them mad. I'd rather make them mad than sin against God. God can take care of you. They can't take care of me. God can always take care of you. That's one of the hardest lessons you'll ever learn. You know what Joseph learned? He knew God could take care of him. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, never hesitates. Joseph continues to tell him it will be an answer of peace. I already know what the answer is going to be, Pharaoh. I've got peace in my heart. Whatever you're going to ask me, Joseph might have already known what the dream was. Whatever you're going to ask me, it's going to be an answer of peace. And Pharaoh then goes off and tells him. 17. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I, I stood upon the, the bank of the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat-fledged and well-favored, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor, ill-favored, very ill-favored, uh, favored and lean-fleshed, such as I've never saw in all the land of Egypt for uh, badness. Uh, that was added by Pharaoh. So is the rest of this. And the lean and ill-favored favored kind did eat uh, up the first seven fat kind. And when they had eaten uh, them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them up, eaten them. But uh, they were still ill-favored as at the beginning, so I woke. And he goes, that was a bad dream. Pharaoh adds more description to this dream than he did the first time when he was telling his people. Joseph now gets a little bit uh, expanded version of what that dream was. And he goes, and I saw in my dream, verse 22, and behold, seven ears uh, came up in one stalk full of good. Now, usually a, an ear, a corn of ear, a, a, a stalk will have two, two, maybe three, maybe three, but usually two ears on it, sometimes three, uh, never seven. I mean, seven is, is out there. I had a guy one time, oh, there's seven ears on it. I said, sorry, corn just don't do that unless it's some weird corn back there that they had that, that was unique. But this is a dream's sake. And behold, seven ears, withered, thin, and blasted with the east wind, sprang up after them. And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told uh, this unto the magicians, but there was none that could, could declare it to me. Pharaoh states that no one can interpret the dream uh, to him that is in his court. That means that all the gods of Pharaoh, all the gods of Egypt, all the other gods out there, Cannot come up with an answer. Man, I tell you what, have you ever got an answer to prayer? You ever sit down and you know that uh, something inside you says this is going to happen or you're praying about that thing and then all of a sudden God gives you peace and it, it works out. And you're sitting there going, I don't know how it's going to work out, but you watch the hand of God. And sometimes you won't even know it. God worked the thing out until the thing happens and you go, whoa, I prayed for that. I remember praying for that. And then you start looking back at the, the steps that it just took to get to there. Uh, you remember there's 8 billion people on this planet, and you ask God for something, it may take a while for you to get it. He, he's working out 8 billion problems. Actually, he may not be working out 8 billion problems. Surely he's working out more than one. And you want something, I want something, everybody else wants something, and all this stuff has to work into play where everybody's prayers come in, to, and God's answering them all. He's answering them his way. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's maybe, wait, who knows what it is, but God's got to answer those things. It's not that he can't answer them all at once. It wouldn't be any good to you for him to answer it right now. You would learn nothing. You know where you learn stuff is time. Time and chance happening to every man. You have to go. Young people, if you're in here, young, you got to go through stuff. 
Life is made to go, you know what's wrong with us? You got that, I don't have my phone with me. Praise God, hallelujah, I left it home. But we're so used to now instant everything. I was looking on something on the internet last night, and, and uh, my, my web page, the first thing that comes up is this Bing garbage and the AI. And it says, tell us what you want, or this or that or the other, the other, and we'll research all this stuff and give you. I'm like, I don't want you to do none of that stuff for me. I don't want none of that. I don't want no part of that. What they're doing is they're taking away your brain. You know why? Because now you don't have to think. You'll, they'll give you an answer. You'll do what they say. And they're training you how to be a, just a slug. You're going to raise a bunch of slugs so that when the Antichrist does take this place over, he's going to say something and everybody's going, yeah, yeah, that's what the Internet says. That's what we got to do. Yeah, that's what we got to do. Yeah, that's what we got to do. That's like our colleges right now. Some of the professors are coming out against those that are coming out against Israel, which I was kind of amazed at that. I said, I wouldn't think they would do that. Some of the professors at some of these colleges, liberal colleges are actually coming out on the side of Israel. But you got a mass, massive amount of people in colleges, teens, youth, young people going through college that are against Israel and on Palestine's side. Guess what got to happen when all this stuff happens? The whole world is going to turn against Israel. That thing is being set up right in front of you. You're watching it. Your news media is already, well, I better shut up. That's, that's digressing. Uh, Pharaoh adds more description here. And he goes on, tells him the second dream about the ears, and Pharaoh states that no one can interpret it in his court. Once Pharaoh stops, Joseph sits there and is quiet. We had a guy in church here one time, and I would say something, he'd say something. I'm like, I don't need you to say anything. Shut your mouth. Uh, this is not your venue for you to say anything. You need, if I'm asking questions, I've had other people come in and say, well, I go to other churches, they have questions and answers, and you should, I'm like, this isn't that venue. If I wanted to ask questions, I'd say, does anybody got a question? If I don't ask you, you shut your mouth. When you get up here, guess what? I'll shut mine. Uh, you tell people that, you know what Joseph did? Exactly. Your examples are all right here. You read your Bible. You look at it. You say, hmm, maybe I should listen. God gave you two ears, one mouth. Maybe you should listen twice as much as you talk. I know you think that's hard for me to do, but I can do that. I really can. Pharaoh states that. Joseph, Joseph then says to Pharaoh, when Pharaoh stops, tells him the whole dream, Joseph now knows it's my turn. And Joseph says unto Pharaoh, you know, God's going to give you an opportunity. I, I said a few minutes ago, time and chance happens to every man. God will always give you the opportunity to succeed. Always. The, the question is, is when is that opportunity? When is that time? You need to wait. Esther waited for her time. She did not know it was her time until Mordecai came up and said, hey, this is occurring out here, and, and Haman's out to kill us all. Do you know that? She didn't have no clue that was even going on. She was isolated up in the, uh, the palace there. She had no idea what was going on. But Mordecai was like her ears and her, her, ground, her feelings on the ground. And when he brought that up to her, he said, now you need to do this. And that started, she had to say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. If I go in there, this is what's going to happen. I need to make sure I understand what I'm doing before I go in there. And, and God started preparing her. But that was her time. But God already had that planned out before the foundation of the world. He already knew exactly what Ahasuerus was going to do. Haman didn't sneak up on him. He already knew what that was going to do. He already knew that, uh, that Esther was put into a position. She was lifted into a position so that when it came time that the Lord wanted something done, he had her right where she needed to be so Mordecai could do what he wanted to do and Ahasuerus would listen so that later on down the road when Ahasuerus and Cyrus and all these other people said, we got to let Israel go back, they had or met God enough that they believed that thing and let it happen. Those guys let Israel go back in. That wasn't just a moment thing. That was a 70-year thing. God already said you're going to be in captivity 70 years anyways. <laughs> like it. Or lump it. It don't matter. You're going to be in. He didn't even let Daniel see that thing until the, almost the end of the 70 years. And Daniel said, and, and Daniel, he goes, I, by the letters, he's reading Jeremiah, and all of a sudden he understood. Well, it's right there in front of me. Jeremiah says 70 years, 70 weeks. He got it, man. He goes, that, we're going to be in captivity 70 years. We're getting ready to come out. And all that stuff, God started working. We lose that sometimes in the process where God is working through our lives and everybody else's lives for him to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And Joseph being in prison was right where he needed to be so that when it came time, God could elevate him up and Joseph could be there. It wasn't, wasn't just a, 
a time and chance. It wasn't just a moment in time where God said, oh, I need somebody. Let me go. Oh, there's Joseph. No, Joseph was in the preparing the whole time, uh, just like everybody else. David, all of them, all of them were in. David was out in the middle of the field out there killing bears and lions so that he could one day be king. Everything you do from the time you wake up in the morning to the time, if you give it to the Lord, is, is a training course that he's putting you through. And it may be 20, 30 years before you ever do it. I tell people all the time, I said, we didn't start this church until I was 48. I wish sometimes I could have started it when I was 25. Then I'd have been through about half the trouble. Y'all might actually have a good pastor today. I don't know. But I wasn't. That wasn't what the Lord did. His, his idea was something else. So uh, it, this is what it is. Pharaoh, Pharaoh states himself, Joseph, Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream is one. Right off the bat. So Pharaoh, both of those dreams are one dream. He said the seven good kind and the seven good ears, and the seven bad uh, kind, and the seven bad ears. Uh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he's about to do. Joseph is now doing what the Lord had sent him to Egypt to do. Brethren, sometimes you, you, we look at our lives back there and we think we're a failure. You're a, you may be in this world as the world sees it, but why would you even care what the, why would you even care what the world thinks? Why would we even care? I don't care what they think. Uh, I'm just trying to do everything I'm supposed to do on a daily basis so that what the Lord sticks in front of that apartment over there. We got apartment number one's online. It is actually online. They're living in it right now. Uh, everything's done. We got some outside stuff to do, but the outside, we got a second one we're working on. Uh, God stuck that in our lap. Now, you can either look at it in your lap and say, I'm not going to do nothing with it, or you go do something with it. That is, that's no different than Joseph working in the, in the dungeon or working for Potiphar. That is what he stuck in our lap. You say, well, was it God's will that you got that? Well, we prayed for it. I did at least for seven, eight years, and it was dumped in our lap. Now what do you do? Well, you fix it. You don't let it just sit there and, and go to waste. You fix it. You know what most people do? Well, I ain't got time. That's what the problem is. You ain't got time for God and what he sticks in your life right now because it just don't kind of match up with what you think you should do. And sometimes we're so far out of God's will we don't even see it because we're so busy trying to do our stuff that we never understand that it's God's stuff that we should be trying to do. And then you got to look at what God has done. It's a blessing, man. I'll tell you what. I, 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 like, I like doing this stuff. I like doing it because I, it's really a no-brainer. I mean, here it is. I'm like, Lord, would you ever quit giving us this stuff so I can quit doing this stuff so I can just get back to doing nothing all day long? Like, they, everybody says a pastor should be visiting people all over the place. He never gives me time to do that. I'm so wore out by the time I get done with on a, on a Monday through Friday basis. I had to call Mike. I told uh, uh, the other, we got into the, the last thing we was doing over there. We, everybody, they were done pretty much. And I got in the bathroom, and I had to cover this one heater vent about this long. And I ended up taking it out, and I had to call Mike and said, Houston, Mike, well, actually, uh, Brother Barry called him. He said I was a coward, and I wouldn't call him. Uh, but I was just sitting down working, and, and Brother Barry had the phone, and he was, he was dying to call him anyways. So he calls him, and he says, Houston, we have a problem. And Mike had to come out on Saturday, and we finished it up, and, and Rich and his son was over finishing up some siding. We got lights on, got everything done. And it's over. That one is over. I'm like, there's only five more to go. <laughs> Uh, but it, that'll be over, too, if you just keep knocking it out and knocking it out and knocking it out and knocking it out. I'm like, Lord, why can't I just sit down and do nothing, like visit everybody all day long? Because that's not what he's got in front of me. And he didn't have that in front of Joseph. And he didn't have that in front of David. And he didn't have, and you may have the ability to do some of that, and you should. But you got to stop sometimes and say, okay, Lord, what are, why would a, an apartment building and a piece of property matter to you? He wondered, are you going to do with what I stuck in you? Or are you going to take care of it? I give you a pound, are you going to turn it into something else? Are you going to make this thing work or not? Are you going to let it fall apart? Why would I give you something else if you can't do this? If you can't do this back here, why would I give you that? I'm not going to give you that because down here, the problem is, is out here somewhere, or the thing you got to remember is out here, you don't know what this is out here. And this out here may be greater than anything you ever do. I may never get a chance to get out there, but some of you may. But you need to say, I, if I don't do this today and do that tomorrow and do whatever's in front of me right now, instead of all this arbitrary stuff that's not even real, you have no idea if you're going to be some great leader in some, you have no idea. You know what you know today, what's in front of you right now? You got a family? Are you taking care of your family? Right now, that's what you should be doing. That, that is it. There is no more. That is it. All the rest of the stuff is what the devil throws out there and the world throws out there in your mind. You ever watched, I'm going to 
probably offend some people here, but I don't really care. It's, it's, I got seven minutes. They say, go get a college education. And then everybody gets in debt and they can't pay the college education off. But that's okay. They say, go get a college education. Why? So you can fill, fill a billet over here, fill a hole for us until, until you live your whole life doing that. And at the end of your life, we keep, you know how many people I've talked to after they retired said they were just used the whole time? They felt like they were just used right there. I just used me. What did I actually accomplish in my life right there? Well, I was a brain surgeon. Okay, so what? You're a brain surgeon. It doesn't matter. That's where they had you ticketed and sit there, and that's what you did. You're not one of these guys up here on the hospital. You're not one of these guys out here doing all this other stuff. You're the guy down here or the lady down here that's just doing what they said or cleaning up the, the – that should be a means to an end for us. I've got a job. It's paying my bills, and I can serve Christ. It isn't that I, I don't have time to serve Christ. I've got to do this. No, no. I've got, I've got to use this to pay my bills, and I can do this and do this and serve Jesus Christ. We've got it backwards, and we let the world tell us it's backwards, and that's okay. Joseph is now doing what the Lord called him to do. He sent him into Egypt. Number one, to save Egypt. If you can't save Egypt, you can't do nothing else. You've got to save Egypt. But there's a bigger, bigger, bigger uh, plan behind that than just saving Egypt. It's saving his family. And there's a bigger thing behind saving his family because in a couple years you're going to have uh, lots of people in Egypt that you're going to bring out and he's going to build a nation in Egypt that he's going to bring out, and they're going to inherit the land. All the problems he goes through with all that stuff. Joseph is sitting here. You know what? Joseph comes in there, and he does exactly what he's supposed to do. Seven good count or seven years. Joseph starts telling him what the dream is. Seven good, down in verse 26. 27. Seven, uh, the seven uh, thin and ill-favored kind came up after the, uh, them in the seven years and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind, and the seven uh, years of famine, they're all one. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh, what God is about to do, verse 28. Uh, he showeth unto Pharaoh, Behold, there cometh seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all of the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land, and the plenty uh, shall not be known in the land by reason of the uh, following famine, for it shall be very grievous. Uh, verse 32, and for that, for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet, wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Joseph warns Pharaoh. He tells him, uh, and the, he said, the dream was doubled to you. God's going to make, it's set in stone. This thing is going to happen. Now, you have Pharaoh standing there or sitting there. He's sitting on his throne. Joseph is standing before him. He gives him the interpretation. Uh, Pharaoh grasps the interpretation. The Holy Spirit is working in Pharaoh's heart for him to believe. Not like the Pharaoh down the road where Moses is talking. This Pharaoh right here is actually listening. And he sees Joseph on a moment's notice, brought up out of the dungeon. Joseph is standing in front of him. He gives him the answer, and Pharaoh grasps that answer and believes it and reacts according to what Joseph just said. Brethren, you know what preaching does? Preaching is to get you to react to what is being said out of the Word of God. When you don't react, you've got to look at yourself, which Pharaoh am I like? The one that ends up drowning in the Red Sea after a little while? He didn't drown immediately. God gave him moment after moment after plague after plague after plague after plague after plague until he kills all the firstborn in somebody's life, and then you still don't believe it. And you go, I, I, that's, a, that's the strangest story I've ever read in my life. I mean, why in the world would you? I've been across the Red Sea twice. Right there at that spot, twice. I've been across that thing. Why would you go out there when the water's welled up on both sides, and you didn't do that? And you're just trusting that whoever's up there somewhere is going to allow you to do that? That's like you get in the book of Revelation and those people say, let, this, let rocks fall on this and all this other stuff. I'm like, are you crazy? Why don't you just yield? Are we so prideful? Are we so arrogant and so full of pride that we think we're still going to do our... The end of this thing is hell or heaven. That's the end. Doesn't matter about nothing else. You can throw everything else. I don't care how, how a person lives. You throw it all out. The end of this thing is heaven or hell. That's why I like Pilgrim's Progress. 
The guy's got some things wrong in the book. I got that. I've had people say, well, it's all wrong. So you throw the baby out with the bathwater. You just throw it all out. I read that book the first time I read it. Man, the first thing that burnt my brain is Celestial City. There's a place out there I'm headed for. I'm headed for that place. And sometimes I get off track, but I'm headed for that place. And I'm going to remember that my whole life is I'm headed for that place. I'm not headed for Wall Street or New York or San Francisco, Los Angeles. I'm not headed for none of that. I'm headed for that place right there. I'm not going to forget that I'm headed for that place. And sometimes I'm going to make a mistake and I'm going to get off track. But even over here, I can remember that place and I can get back on track and remember that place. That place is where I'm going to heaven. I got out of hell and I'm going to heaven. I got out of hell. I'm not going there no more, so that's where I'm going. If I'm going to go there, then I need to make an an attempt to get there in one piece. I don't want to be, like you said, you pull out an ear or a toe or whatever out of the lion's mouth. and I don't want to be that. I want to get there in, maybe in rags, but I want to get there. Uh, Joseph warns Pharaoh that the dream is set in stone. Joseph not only tells Pharaoh what is about to happen, but also gives him direction on how to survive the upcoming famine. That shows you right there grace. Joseph could have held that back, not really cared about Pharaoh, not cared about Egypt. You guys just bought me, and Potiphar bought me, and I was over here, and I got in all kinds of trouble there, and you threw me down to prison. You did all this other, you treated me bad for all these years, and now you want me to help you? That's not, that's not Joseph. You want a picture of a Christian? Right there that thing is. You want a picture of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Right there that thing is. You know, you can come, it says, come now boldly into the throne of grace. You can come to Jesus Christ anytime you want to, and he's going to have the same attitude. He's going to look at you and say, are you sorry? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. He's already forgiven you. He, he's already, he, that thing's under the blood. I like, I like 1 John. He says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. How does he do that? By the blood of Jesus Christ. It says right there, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's what does it. Right there, he goes, Mike, I've already forgiven you. You know the hardest thing you ever do is forgive yourself. He's already done it. It's forgiving yourself. And letting that thing go by, I said, okay, I blew it. He goes, I know you're framed, but you're dust. There's verses in the Bible I just will not get rid of. I already know that I'm a mess, and people say you're a mess. Yeah, I'm a mess. But he said he loves me, and he said he died for me. And Joseph is sitting here portraying that exact same thing. Joseph, I, I wrote this little thing. Joseph, here's how Joseph suggests. This is how what we would do. Joseph suggests that a committee be set up to consider all the options so they could recommend a plan of action and the necessary steps that need to be taken to ensure that the royal family and the Pharaoh's staff would survive. That is not what Joseph did. Joseph looked at the whole picture of this thing. He looked at everything out there. I don't think Joseph was even thinking about his family. He was looking at all the people that was in his his purview, his view that he could think about. And Joseph tells Pharaoh in a uh, purely suggestive capacity. I'm just telling you. Pharaoh, I'm telling you, this is what God said. How to set up an organization to be able to manage the storing of the food for the first seven years so that there will be adequate stores uh, for the seven years of famine. He goes, Pharaoh, I'm telling you, this is what God said. Here's your dream. I'm telling you what the interpretation is. And here's what you need to do. Set you up some guys out there. Find some guys that you can trust, and they will do the job for you. Verse 37, and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servant. Everything Christ did, they said, they said over in the New Testament, he had done all things well. He hasn't stopped anywhere. Never, ever, ever. Joseph, the same thing. i got to stop right now because it's 1052. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning.